Would that be helpful? Thank you. Uh, good evening, and thanks for joining us for this presentation of our firearm safety workshop. I'm Vicki Paulison, and along with Christina Schlitt, Christina, uh, co-chair the Firearm Safety Network of the League of Women Voter of the State of Michigan. And as our members know, the League is a nonprofit political organization uh, that works to protect voters' rights and encourages informed and active participation in government. And throughout its 100-year existence, it has remained nonpartisan. The League influences public policy through education and advocacy. And one of the, our advocacy groups is a firearm safety network, which began as a result of the first presentation of this workshop at the May convention last year. Now this is a workshop, so we invite you to participate tonight by using your cell phone and signing in with Poll Everywhere. And in just a minute, I'll show you how to do that. I'm gonna share my screen. And where's my thing here? And there. Okay. Can you see my full size screen? Everyone? Yep. Okay. Great. I'm I'm just on audio, so I can't see it, but I can hear you. Oh, okay. Well, hey, um, the view. Yeah, you got. We don't have the full size screen. Okay. There How's that? Go. Now we have it. Okay, great. Okay, thank you. Um, so as a workshop, we are allowing you to be interactive and working with us. Um, so the way to do that is to pull out your cell phone and open up your text messaging system. And uh, the number that you're going to text to is two two three three three. And what you're going to text to that number is Vicki Paulison 166. It's all one phrase, no caps, Vicki Paulison 166. Um, if you're on the phone, you spell that with V-I-C-K-I-P-A-U-L-I-S-S-E-N 166, no spaces. And if you've done that properly, you're going to get a message saying you've joined our group. I'll give everybody a couple of minutes to get that done. Your participation is completely anonymous and completely optional this evening. Um, and you will still have an opportunity to enter questions in our chat box for the Q&A session after our uh, end of the presentation. But if you'd like to participate in this part, um, please text 22333. And the message you're going to send is Vicki Paulison 166. All right, let's see. We were successful with that. Our first question, whoops, sorry, before I go to the first question, um, you should have received a message something like this that says you've joined a uh, poll everywhere. Um, and many of the questions are multiple choice. Some of them have uh, the option of entering several letters as your choice. So when you do that, you need to enter the letters with a comma or space between them. Uh, please do not enter them all in a row. All right, so now we can test this out. All right, this is going to create a word cloud. We've already have a couple of um, messages in here, type one word that describes how you feel about the state of firearm violence in America. Just one word, how you're feeling about it right now. We already have discouraged and sad, depressed, horrified, very negative terms, unhappy, Terrified, frustrated, mad. Okay, so we hope through the course of this discussion, we get a little bit glimmer of hope in how we can deal with this. Um, and so obviously the system's working, so we're gonna move on here. And our agenda tonight, um, we're going to have a presentation by Christina Schlitt and Sue Smith. 
bring us up to date on the status of current gun safety legislation and its enforcement in the state of Michigan. And then we're going to turn to Laura Seewald from the Institute for Firearm Injury Prevention at U of M uh, to let us know what current research tells us and what possible solutions to this public health crisis exist. And then as we go along, we'd like to know what you think about this. And we'll have a question and answer period and an invitation at the end. Um, if you could please mute yourself, that would be really helpful. Okay, so Christina. Thank you, Vicki. <clears throat> a series of common sense bills related to firearm safety that were passed through the legislature last year will take effect this year in February. Bills include universal background checks to all firearm purchases from handguns to long guns. Um, thought, the thought process also carries over into background checks which have only been required when purchasing a handgun in Michigan. New legislation signed into law recently will establish background checks for all gun purchases, including long guns and rifles. It is argued that more and more thorough background checks can help prevent people with bad intentions from legally purchasing a firearm, especially those with criminal and domestic violence histories. The push for gun safe storage grew after the 2021 Oxford High School shooting. Prosecutors argued that if the shooter's parents had locked up the handgun in their home, the shooter wouldn't have had wouldn't have been able to access it so easily and bring it to school to carry out the shooting. House Bill 4138, same as Senate Bill 76, gun safety requires background check to purchase a firearm. And as violence happens more often among children, particularly younger children we, who have easy access to a firearm in their home, Officials believe requiring owners to safely store firearms will help keep them out of the children's hands. Senate Bill 79 requires a person to keep a firearm stored or left unattended on a premise unloaded and locked, either with a locking device or stored in a locked container. If it is reasonably known that a minor is or is likely to be present on the premises. The Senate Bill 80 updates Michigan criminal code for firearm safety storage as it relates to child access protection. And Senate bills 81 and 82 lower the cost of gun safety devices in an effort to allow easier access to materials needed to safely store firearms. Next. Okay. Next. Also signed into law are the, the establishment of red flag laws, which would allow law enforcement to temporarily take guns away from a person that a judge deems to be a risk to themselves or others. Contrary to some rhetoric, red flag laws don't seek to take away guns from responsible gun owners. In fact, ex experts say the solution to gun violence isn't taking away guns from responsible owners at all. Specifically, red flag laws are meant to protect a gun owner or others around them if that owner is considered dangerous. Whether the gun violence looks like a mass shooting, interpersonal violence, or suicide, red flag laws have the potential to keep a person in distress from accessing deadly a deadly weapon. It's about preventing people who have access who shouldn't. Next. Domestic violence is a serious problem in our state. We know that from the data and from hearing directly from survivors that domestic violence and firearms are a deadly mix. 
Senator Chang said in a statement after the bills were signed, after many years of work on this legislation to protect domestic violence survivors from firearm death or in injury, I am happy that we have finally done so. The new laws, which will take effect this February, bar those convicted of domestic violence from buying, owning, or transpar transporting a gun for a period of eight years after their sentence. In a statement, Governor Whitmer said the common sense gun violence prevention bills will assure that violent criminals cannot harm others and that survivors are protected from further violence. At least 31 other states have passed similar laws to temporarily disarm those convicted of domestic abuse. Under the bills, those convicted of domestic violence misdemeanor could regain the opportunity to possess, use, purchase, or carry a firearm after the eight-year period. Under current law, only those convicted of felonies are banned from possessing using or buying or carrying a gun. But under these new bills, state lawmakers, that statewide ban will expand this year to include, include those who have been convicted of misdemeanor domestic violence charges for a period of eight years. Federal statistics show that there were 341 domestic violence homicides in Michigan between 2003 and 2012. Of those, more than half of the victims were killed with guns. Research also shows access to a gun makes it five times more likely that an abusive individual will kill their partner. Nearly half of all women murdered in the United States are killed by a current or former intimate partner because domestic violence almost always escalates in the severity of abuse. Next. There are some laws that are pending which include the possession of firearms at polling places. Now, there may be other bills in the development, but these were introduced in the legislature. And the possession of firearms at a polling location prohibits firearms from within 100 feet of voting places, absentee counting boards, and absentee voting boxes. Next. There we go. Now this isn't legislation, but it's interesting to note that Michigan State Capitol Commission bans most visitors from carrying concealed guns inside the Capitol. Mm. The rules exempt state lawmakers following concerns from some who wish to keep carrying guns to work. If lawmakers may introduce in legislation to write the policy into state law, one commissioner is advocating for that to happen. The Capitol Commission voted unanimously to ban concealed and carry on state capitals, and they joined 24 other states in barring most Capitol visitors from carrying guns. But the commissioners voted to exempt serving state lawmakers from the sweeping ban as long as they have a concealed carry permit. There will be a sign at the east entrance of the state capitol building in Lansing, which reads, no weapon, weapons are permitted within the capitol building. All individuals entering the capitol building are subject to the policies and procedures of the Michigan State Capitol Commission. Only security staff, active law enforcement officers, active federal enforcement agents, private security details and serving state lawmakers with a concealed weapon, concealed carry weapon permit are allowed to carry concealed weapons inside the building. Under the procedure, future lawmakers would like also to be exempt once they are sworn in, Commission Chair William Candler told reporters. The exemption of lawmakers came after several lawmakers um, in the legislature expressed a desire to keep carrying guns into the Capitol. Next. Next slide, please. Thank you. 
This is the league position that LWVMI Advocacy Committee uses to determine their support or oppose recommendation to the board in relation to the firearm safety bills. This position was adopted at the 1990 convention by concurrence and updated at each of the 1994 and 98 conventions. Future bills introduced in the Michigan legislature and moved into committees will be evaluated against this permission, this position. I'm not sure if you can read this. I hope that you can because there were position on semi-automatic and automatic weapons. Um, the league supports licensing procedures for gun ownership and they um, advocate for license fees should be adequate to bear the cost of education and verification. And the league supports strong limitations on access to semi-automatic and automatic weapons. Um, you can read the history and rationale in the um, league publication, Impact on Issues 2022 through 24. And you can find that on the lwv.org website. Or if you're really interested, you can purchase it through Amazon. So with that, I'd like to say thank you for your time. And Sue Smith, I believe you are next. Thank you, Christina. I'd like to say a few words about so-called constitutional county resolutions. The resolution is refusing to enforce unconstitutional laws, mandates, and executive orders. And the people who decide whether it's constitutional or not are the people who vote for it in their county, the county commissioners. This is not new. It's been around for a number of years, but since the passage of the um, ERPO, the, um, the gun safety law that um, requires that those who are subject to uh, domestic violence using a judicial procedure as Christina has just described, um, can lose their guns for a period of time. Once that, or since that was passed, a number of other counties, in addition to those who passed these resolutions a number of years ago, suddenly decided that they needed to also pass this county resolution. And um, this topic was covered in a TV program called Off the Record, I'm sure a number of you are familiar with it, hosted by Tim Skubik on WKAR-TV. And he had invited um, Michigan Attorney General to attend the meeting and talk about these constitutional county resolutions. And she made an a number of important statements that are listed here. First of all, these resolutions that counties might choose to pass are not legally binding on local law enforcement. Secondly, these gun safety laws are constitutional. Third, the Michigan State Police will enforce these laws. These are state laws. Then the issue of what to do about the sheriffs or prosecutors who might uh, refuse to enforce them. Uh, we have to remember that sheriffs and prosecutors are elected officials, and they have the right to choose which laws they want to enforce in their communities. However, since they are elected, they are judged by the voters in their communities. <clears throat> Excuse me, judged by the voters in their uh, communities. <clears throat> Next slide, please. So the red flag law, or commonly called ERPO, which uh, of course stands for Extreme Risk Protection Order, is supported by the Michigan Sheriff's Association. And in fact, they were consulted as the legislation was being written. Uh, and of course it was passed by, by the House and the Senate and signed by the governor 
Um, it didn't get enough votes for immediate effect, but um, since the legislature left early during the month of November, it will take effect in February of 2024, 90 days after the end of the session year, which was November 2023. Next slide, please. Vicki, did you want to do a question at this point? Sure. So um, the question here is, how do you think red flag laws will be received in your community? And you can choose from A, B, C, or D, but only one. Just type the letter in. Doesn't have to be capital or lowercase, doesn't matter. Okay, it looks like the responses are in. The majority feel that uh, in their community, um, the red flag logs are going to be accepted as required by the law, but you can see 17%, oh, we have another one in here. 17% uh, or 14 now has declared itself a second amendment sanctuary. Uh, and Sue, just address that. You wanna address that again, Sue? Yes, I think it really is important to keep in mind that um, declaring itself a second amendment sanctuary has no legal basis. This is a state law. It will be enforced by the state police. And um, a lot of misinformation is out there, uh, which is not surprising given that it's such an emotional uh, issue, but it, we need to be sure that we share the correct information. That is that this is a state law. It will be enforced by the state police and declaring yourself a second amendment sanctuary um, or refusing to enforce laws that you have decided are unconstitutional um, is not legal. And people should not be misled by these statements that are sometimes made. So what can we do? <clears throat> Well, I think as we all know, the best thing to do when there's misinformation is to provide the correct information. So the State League will be preparing educational material concerning these laws and the enforcement for local leagues to, leagues to use in educating their communities regarding these firearm safety laws. Next. Thank you, Sue. Um, I want to now introduce Dr. Seawald. She's an assistant professor at the University of Michigan's Institute for Firearm Safety or Firearm Injury Prevention. And she's also in the Department of Emergency Medicine there. Uh, she's also an, practicing emergency medicine uh, at Hurley Medical Center up in Flint. And her research is centered on development, testing, and implementation of emergency department based interventions to decrease multiple types of violence, and that includes firearm and associated risk behaviors among high risk urban population. I'm gonna turn things over now to, to Laura. Great, hi everyone, and thank you again for having me. It's nice to be back and giving this talk again. Um, so yes, today I'm gonna to be talking about the role of evidence-based research um, in firearm injury prevention. And the objectives of today's talk are really going to be focused on kind of just discussing what firearm injuries are, what the magnitude of the problem is in the U.S., the framework for developing solutions that we use uh, to think about reducing injury, what the role of academic, of academic institutions are, um, as well as the role of evidence-based uh, evidence research and in, um, injury prevention science. Uh, I'll discuss a little bit what my institute does as well. Uh, as well as the pathway forward for de developing solutions. And then we'll have some time for questions and comments at the end. So what is a firearm injury? Um, there are a lot of different types of injuries with lots of different types of intent. So one that we think about is an intentional self-inflicted injury. 
which would be something like suicide. You have unintentional injuries as well, which are largely, uh, we think about when someone is playing with a gun or cleaning the gun, and that result re results in either a uh, fatal or non-fatal injury. There's also injuries uh, that result for interpersonal violence, which are oftentimes homicide or an assault. There are also things that we call legal intervention um, uh, injuries that are uh, injuries that occur or deaths that occur um, when law enforcement are involved. And then there are a lot of different types of injuries that have an undetermined intent, uh, and we will never know why that injury happened. So there's a lot of diverse perspectives, but at the end of the day, there's a lot of common goals too. So whether, you know, it doesn't matter your, your uh, political party, uh, your role in society, your age, but the goal of most U.S. Um, citizens is really to decrease the number of deaths and injury that result from firearms. And we like to think, uh, you know, firearm injury prevention researchers really like to think of firearm injuries as a public health disease. So we want to treat it the same way that we did with developing car seats and bike helmets and, you know, not smoking during pregnancy and addressing this the same way. Uh, we also think about, you know, if you think about childproof caps, right, you know, you actually don't even think about them anymore. But that took a lot of time and innovation between both the public health sector and the private industry to develop um, really effective and rather cheap at this point solutions um, to preventing, you know, kids from getting to uh, dangerous medications or household chemicals. Next slide. And this slide again just highlights once again our thought about uh, firearms being a public health issue. So. One of our former Surgeon Generals, uh, David Satcher, said, you know, if firearms, uh, if it's not a public health, if it's not a health issue, then why are people dying from it? And this is just a, a quick question to kind of gauge, um, uh, you know, what, what, what folks here kind of know about firearm deaths. And so if you can answer the question of what age range you think is disproportionately affected by firearm deaths. All right, so it looks like kind of split between, um, you know, this younger, these two younger age groups, as well as uh, 25 to 40 years. So we'll we'll get to that uh, answer in just a couple slides. So again, thinking about firearm injury is a national public health problem. So this slide really tells the tale of um, two stories. So one is the success story. And one we would say is a less successful story. So, um, you know, for the first time in 2017, firearms actually uh, overtook motor vehicle crashes in terms of the number of deaths that year. And most of these are from suicide, 54% uh, or so, and about 44% of these deaths are homicide related. But so while you see firearm deaths going up, you see motor vehicle deaths from motor vehicle crashes going way down. And so, again, it shows that when we think of these things as public health problems, we really can make big changes and decrease the number of deaths as we focus on it in a, in a way that encompasses multiple, um, multiple thoughts to develop uh, uh, effective interventions. Uh, next slide. Uh, this slide looks over at the overall kind of fatality and risk by intent uh, by various ages. You actually see two peaks here. The first one is highlighted in orange, which is between a 10 and 24 year old group, uh, where you mostly see firearm homicides being responsible for most deaths. Then as you get older, um, particularly around the age of uh, 70 and older, you see another peak. And unfortunately that's uh, largely from firearm suicides. Um, firearms are now the leading cause of death for children and teens as of 2020. 
men are disproportionately affected uh, compared to women across all age groups and all intents. And about 54% of intimate partner homicides are firearm related. And this kind of helps us answer that first question here. And this talks about youth firearm deaths specifically. And so youth actually 15 to 24 are at the highest risk for a firearm death. And firearm injuries in this group are responsible for one out of every four deaths among this population of 15 to 24 year olds. Um, looking over to the right here, we can see that the firearm injury mechanism varies by age uh, in children and youth. So when kids are a little bit younger, from zero to about 10, it's a lot of unintentional injuries and unfortunately a lot of homicides, which are typically the result from um, being uh, collateral, they're called collateral deaths, which is a little bit of a harsh term, but basically it's um, children who are harmed during the course of an intimate partner violence incident. Uh, where their parents uh, or where their caregivers was involved. And then uh, when kids hit 10 and up, you start to see suicide um, emerging a little bit as well. Next slide, please. So this looks at the racial and ethnic disparities um, across firearm injuries and deaths. And we see that firearms are the leading cause of death for Black youth as and the homicide rate for um, Black Americans is about six times higher than other racial groups. Uh, however, suicides are, rates are higher among whites and Native American and Alaska yeah. Natives. Um, and it's really important to kind of consider some of these structural and social factors and how they relate to firearm injuries. And yes, next slide, please. This is another important slide because I think a lot of times uh, the narrative can be seen that Firearm deaths are often an urban problem, um, and you know, really, they focus a lot on the homicide rates in in urban city in urban centers. But here you can see, so yes, um, you do have more homicides the more urban you are, but that really starts to drop us as you go more suburban, and then you see a stark rise, unfortunately, in suicide deaths, which are over overwhelmingly a problem um, in rural communities. So again. While the mechanisms are different, it really shows that firearm deaths uh, affect every community. We really need to think about some of the structural factors, um, including community disinvestment, poverty, and other things that uh, access to mental health, and how those all play into you know, uh, increasing firearm deaths in the US. Next slide. So this slide is to highlight uh, one of our big gaps, actually, in um, and our knowledge in the firearm injury prevention um, sciences, which is we really have very poor data on non-fatal injuries. So this is a problem when you think about it from a prevention standpoint specifically. So if you could think about if we didn't, you know, when COVID happened, for instance, um, it's still happening, but in a different way. But you know, if you think about back to 2019, 2020, there was a large push to have states and cities um, really give their data to the CDC so that we could develop uh, and their state health department so that they could allocate resources appropriately. And when you don't have, when you're missing a bunch of this data, it makes it difficult for researchers and policymakers to figure out what some of the effective solutions should be and where we should put some of these resources. So this is still an area um, in firearm injuries that we're still looking to develop more and get a better understanding of. Uh, next slide. Briefly, this slide really goes to show that basically the severity of um, injuries we're seeing in the hospitals have been increasing over the last 30 years or so. Um, this is largely uh, in part to the fact actually that we're a lot better at taking care of people who've been injured by a firearm. So it's a success story from the fact that um, you know, we have better EMS and ambulances to get people where they need to go. We have better trauma centers who are more equipped. But the severity of injuries that people are living with are much higher and their morbidity um, is much greater as well. Next slide. And the economic costs for fire injuries are huge. It's about 20, uh, $200 billion annually and eight, uh, about $8 billion of that is in direct costs. Uh, so basically acute medical treatment. 
with the remainder being from indirect, indirect costs, largely due to um, lost work uh, and productivity, the lost quality of life, and then criminal justice and jail time. So now we're going to get into the framework we have developed um, for solutions to reduce uh, firearm injury and death. Next slide. So one of the, we have a few different frameworks, and essentially this kind of result, uh, revolves around the idea that we want to identify the problem and define it. Then we want to look at risk and protective factors, develop and test prevention strategies, we want to implement promising initiatives and then monitor and evaluate the effectiveness of these initiatives. So really we're looking at gathering data to um, uh, better understand a problem and that we can actually turn into an action and develop a solution. Next slide. We also use uh, the model of the social ecological spectrum that allows us to really look kind of at all pieces of the puzzle when you're thinking about a public health problem. And so, you know, you never want to focus on just the individuals, not just an individual with a gun, that's a problem. There's a lot of social and community factors that go into that, and a lot of public policy uh, factors that go into it as well. So again, all of these parts fit into, you know, a larger puzzle that help us to think about effective solutions for injury prevention. Next slide. So again, not an accident. Right, motor vehicle. We don't use motor vehicle accidents anymore. We say motor vehicle crashes, um, and we like to think about this as an analogy, uh, or you know, an example of how we want to apply some of the interventions that have been used for preventing motor vehicle crashes to preventing future firearm injury injuries. And this picture here is a really good example of a crash you would never see. Right. So here you see a car that's been crumpled in a way that wouldn't happen anymore. We have different crumple zones. We have seat belts. Uh, that pole wouldn't be that close to the highway anymore. So again, a few different things that we've done to make sure that this crash doesn't exist. Next slide. Uh, again, thinking about some more of those uh, as motor vehicle crashes as a success story and all the different things we've done uh, as a, as a, a society to really focus on decreasing these injuries and deaths. So, you know, we have things like crash avoidance. So you have headlamps and reflectors and anti-lock brakes. We've also improved, improved the crash worthiness of the car. So kind of alluding again to seat belts and airbags and crumple zones. There are actually laws around behavior modifications too. So alcohol impaired driving, for instance. We have a um, blood alcohol level limit. There's also a minimum drink age limit. And then there is zero tolerance loss too. We've also made the roads safer. So we have divided highways, we have signs, curved rails. We've developed a trauma system. Uh, we've developed a trauma system as well. And then there are also increased measures for higher risk populations, right? So children are required to have car seats and there are graduated driver license laws. Um, and elderly individuals have physician reviews. And so all of these things together, you can see on the left side, it's very hard to read this and I apologize, um, but all of these things have been implemented over the last you know, 50, 100 years or 70 years to really decrease firearm, or sorry, re decrease motor vehicle deaths. And so we want to apply those same ideals to uh, firearm injuries. Next slide. This is all based on something called the Hayden Matrix, which was developed by Will Hayden, who was the father of injury epidemiology. Um, and he really helped to broaden the view of prevention, um, injury prevention specifically to more than just a driver, right? So it's not just the driver in the car. It's not just the person with the gun. It's a lot of things that you can do. Um, so it's based on two things. It's the phases and the factors. So phases are broken down into pre-event, so before the crash occurs. Then there's the event, which is during a car crash. Then there's the post event, which is after the crash. And there are different factors. So there's the driver, the host, there's the vehicle, there's the physical environment, and then there's the social environment. And looking at a couple of these things, so if you think about the pre-event and the host and the driver, was the driver impaired? What was their vision like? Do they have knowledge on how to drive a car? And then if you look at the vehicle, and during the event, what? how big is the vehicle? What's the crash worthiness of the vehicle? And then after the event, 
you think about the physical environment factor, again, what is the availability of um, an EMS system or getting people to a trauma care center? Uh, what kind of rehab programs are available to those who are injured? Next uh, slide. So again, we want to take those ideals and really try to apply them to um, firearm injuries and to help prevent them or during the event, what we can do to make um, things more safe. So when you think about a school shooting, for instance, uh, if you kind of look at the agent or vehicle, in this case, we'll highlight a firearm. You know, so before the event, could you actually modify the gun so that they are only operable by the owner? Mm -hmm. During the event, could you actually reduce the capacity of the firearm to fire multiple rounds quickly or modify bullets to be less, less lethal? Lethal. And after the event, could you actually reduce the capacity of the gun to continue firing? Next slide. Uh -huh. So why is firearm prevention sciences uh, lag behind other health issues? So uh, it really has to do with a lack of funding. And this did have to do with the Dickey Amendment that came about in, in the 90s, um, which was interpreted as a way to limit firearm uh, research um though has been uh, has been changing over the last uh 10 years or so uh but you can see that you know you had 2000 deaths from cholera diphtheria polio uh and there were millions and millions of research awards for that but for you know over 4 million deaths during the same time there were three research um awards for injuries from firearms next slide so now, over the last 10 years, like I said, we're starting to develop this um, renewed research focus nationally. And really in the last five years, this has picked up. Uh, but the big turning point, unfortunately, was during the 2012 Newton uh, School shooting. And there's been an increased uh, foundational, uh, in increased foundation focus on funding, which is wonderful. Those are really good grants to kind of help supplement research. But what we've been hoping for, what we're starting to get now are really large, um, funding opportunities from the National Institute of Health, the National Institute of Justice, and the CDC, um, which are, you know, larger million dollar, multi-million dollar studies that really allow us to evaluate um, different aspects of different types of firearm injuries and deaths to really think about what's the best to really develop effective solutions. Um, the University of Michigan, which I'm a part of, it, you know, very grateful for we actually have about 25% of this federal funding at this time. Um, but, you know, we're looking for this to grow not only for ourselves, but also nationally with uh, our collaborators throughout the U.S. Next slide. So, you know, when you think about why, build, why to build an, an institute focused on firearm injury prevention, what we really wanted to do was basically to consolidate uh, existing multidisciplinary faculty with expertise in firearm injury prevention across um, the University of Michigan to develop synergy and build momentum towards solutions. We also wanted to engage new faculty across the campus, stimulate new research directions and collaborations, while also engaging students and trainees across campus to develop and expand the pipeline of faculty and practitioners focused on the area. Uh, and then we also wanted to serve as a research and bridge between both academia and communities, as well as injury prevention practitioners and policymakers to develop effective solutions for uh, firearm injury prevention. Next slide. So here, this is a, uh, a map of the US that shows all of the different national transportation research institutes that, um, what should I say, state research institutes that are dedicated to motor vehicle incidents. So there's about 30 represented here. And if you were to have a map of this for institutes for fire major prevention, you'd see uh, they're growing now. I think we're up to five, but we have ours in Michigan. There's one in Colorado. There's a couple um, in California as well as on the East Coast. But again, you can see that if you really invest in these institutes, you can and build, uh, build the research capacity uh, for researchers then you're able to start to develop solutions to actually address um, you know, this public health problem. Next, pro next slide. So basically the mission um, and structure of our program is that we're developed into 
we have basically five arms of the institute. Uh, they're real, they're again focused on research and scholarship, education and training, community and engagement, data and methods, and then we have a policy arm as well, with the goal to um, focus on finding uh, solutions that will decrease fire injuries in the U.S. Next slide. And our areas of focus are really in suicide, community violence, school and mass shootings, intimate partner violence, unintentional and accidental injuries, and then lethal police force. Next slide. So looking at uh, highlighting some of our community engagement projects, we work with different communities in the U.S., but uh, specifically uh, in Michigan uh, to figure out ways to find, prevent, um, uh, to develop and reduce, to <laughs> develop uh, interventions to prevent fire injuries and deaths. Uh, to highlight a couple, we have a safe storage program in Marquette, Michigan. We also have the hospital-based violence programs uh, in Flint and Detroit, Grand Rapids and Muskegon. And we also have some community green projects in both Flint and Detroit as well. Next slide. So getting into some of the safety laws, um, I know some of the folks here already uh, touched on this earlier, um, but you know you have the universal background screening, you have the CAP laws or the child, um, oh gosh. Oh shoot, I forgot what CAP stands for, but basically to limit uh, access, uh, childhood access to um, uh, firearms. And one thing that we found with those laws, which Michigan has uh, put into the law as well, was that if you actually hold the parents or the adult responsible, um, you know, financially, then those laws actually typically tend to be more effective. And then you have the red flag laws. Next slide. I'm going to focus on these just a little bit. I know uh, Sue talked about it a little as well, too. Uh, but to, just to reiterate that these are civil order laws. So again, um, they're not criminal, but they have a due process. Uh, where the court uh, that is issued by the court when someone is at risk of violence to themselves or others. And the large majority of these ERPO, or these ERPOs are actually um, cited um, due to a risk for suicide. But the most important component of this, we think, is that you have to really consider relinquishment of firearms. And so how that's done effectively. Um, and so while you see these for suicide, you can have them as well for mass shootings, um, or uh, intimate partner violence as well. Next slide. So why is policy implementation and outcomes evaluation so important? So we really wanna make sure that when we have these laws implemented that they're used as intended. We also wanna see and make sure and examine whether there are any unintended or unanticipated consequences, meaning are certain populations disproportionately affected by this law and is it being, you know, or um, is it being enacted against people in a way that it wasn't intended? And then are are these laws um, effective? And then what kind of data do we need um, to best evaluate the firearm injury prevention bills? Well, for in the case of ERPO, we wanna make sure we have the full case files. That means from the day that the um, uh, ERPO was initiated until the case until the case is finally closed. Uh, we want to have any documents pertaining to the removal of the firearm itself and the procedures that went along with that. Um, and then in the case of suicide, but also other incidents as well where the ERPO might be um, initiated, we'd like death certificates too to see if people um, passed away, you know, particularly those who were at risk for suicide if they ended up passing away within, you know, uh, a year, five years, 10 years, and their mechanism uh, of death too. Next slide, please. So we found that with extreme risk protection orders um, where you have a, you can click through actually twice, Vicki. Um, right there is good. Um, that we found those states that actually uh, you know, had these firearm relinquishment laws that were effective. We found about a seven to 13% reduction in firearm suicides. And in a California case study, um, they were able to find that uh, about 56% of the final ERPO, laws, uh, ERPO orders were granted. And there was only a mortality rate of 1.8% um, 
uh, for individuals where the ERPA was enacted. Next slide. And then I wanted to highlight domestic violence restraining orders, which are different than ERPOs. They're um, largely enacted after um, a severe physical abuse incident, but they are effective at preventing intimate partner violence uh, partner homicides, if there's, again, that firearm relinquishment component, which is the hardest part to enact. and But again, the most important when you're thinking about how many deaths uh, are the result of firearms, but spe specifically in intimate partner violence incidents. Um, and those who, those states that have been effective at in, uh, inst instituting these DVROs with a firearm relinquishment law have found a reduction in 15 to 25% of partner homicides. Next slide. Great. Okay. So what can you do? So, you know, there's lots of things. I mean, first of all, you're all here. So um, getting a little more education about the idea of uh, what firearm injury solutions look like, as well as um, what some possible effective interventions might be. Uh, but the biggest thing is just, you know, to continue to learn, um, talk with your friends and family, you know, a lot of you are likely moms or grandmothers or have families. Um, and, you know, if, you're, if your child is going over to someone's house, it's always okay. We encourage people to say, to ask families, you know, um, if their family owns a firearm and if they do, how do they store it? And the more that we ask those sorts of questions, the more, um, the less, let's see, how do I want to say this? Um, the less awkward those questions become and the more common they become across the U.S. to make sure that um, that firearms are being stored safely. And then I know that Vicki's going to touch on this a little later too, but there's also um, the uh, Michigan Gun Violence Prevention Summit at the end of the month too. Next slide. Uh, okay, so thanks. And we're going to have a couple more questions and then we'll open it up to discussion. So this question uh, asks about, uh, does that question ask, how has fire and violence affected your community? And you can select all that apply. So a little bit more of diversity in responses with some folks having more, um, you know, I, the, the largest one I see here is that most people know someone who was killed by a firearm, either uh, by homicide, suicide, or unintentionally, um, while many also have not been personally affected too. Next slide. And... This uh, question is, what solutions do you think would work in your community to reduce firearm violence? And this is a choose all that apply as well. So providing firearm locking devices, having a 14 day waiting period for purchasing a firearm, prohibiting firearm purchasing for those under 21, holding firearm owners responsible for the state's order of their firearms, extreme risk protection orders, all of the above or none of the above would be effective in my community. Well, it seems, seems like most people uh, think that all of these would be effective solutions. And so far, our research has actually showed that generally all of these things do have, again, taken together, um, are, are effective at reducing firearm violence. Next slide. Next 
think we're going to open it up to questions. Is that right? Yes, this is your opportunity um, to put a question in the chat. So far, I see none. Well, then I'm just going to go ahead and ask one. Um, we had a speaker here from the um, VA hospital, Laura. Uh, his name is Matthew Rad, and they have um, a lot of efforts, of course, to help with the veteran population. What what challenges do you see with that population in regards to suicide? You know, they seem to have a lot of programs, but I don't know how effective they are. Yeah. So again, it's not a it's not a one one size fits all situation. Uh, veterans. Um, have been, you know, there's been a lot of focus on this for veterans um, over the last years. It's probably one of the places that we are best studied, actually. Um, but one of the things is, is, you know, so one thing that they focus on is safe storage, but it's a particularly tough community because a lot of these people, um, you know, have firearms in their house and as part of their kind of cultural components in some ways to have firearms. So we talk about safe storage with them. And then also, again, it's kind of um, pairing that with uh, interventions like counseling and things like that uh, with larger groups to kind of talk about, you know, reasons that they are, you know, in the case of suicide, which is one of the big things we think about with veterans, uh, in cases of suicide, to make sure that when they're feeling more depressed, that they're able to talk to someone um, who can then encourage them to store their firearms more safely or to get the firearm off of their property. Um, and then in cases of, you know, if uh, veterans who, you know, are involved in domestic violence disputes, again, using their community and their their workers to help um, them figure out ways to to decrease the potential for lethality by um, by getting the, the firearm access away from, from that. So it's not only safe storage, it's really pairing it with um, effective counseling as well. Uh, through multi, you know, multiple layers, essentially. Thank you. Thank you. We do have a question now. It is, is there conversation about limiting or licensing ammunition in addition to firearms? So there has been conversations about this. I don't think at this point it's gone very far. Um, right now, I think most places are still in the the phase of can we just sort of get some, um, you know, what's called the common sense laws that most of Michigan has passed at this point, uh, kind of through, and then discussing, you know, what what ammunition purchasing would look like, and can you kind of pair that with some of those more common sense laws? So yeah, so to answer the question, yes, there's been a discussion. So far, I haven't seen um, anything really go far with that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We mentioned the um, Gun Violence Prevention Summit. It is the 29th and the 30th of January. It is hosted by the End Gun Violence in Michigan group, of which the League of um, is a part of the coalition. And um, we encourage you to consider being part of it. And here's the registration in the chat. And if you're interested in becoming a part of the Firearm Safety Network, here is the link for you to inquire or to sign up. Yeah, I'll get that posted in just a second here. Go back to my slides. The... Um, the um, summit is being hosted, I believe, by the Firearm Safety Institute. Is that correct, Laura? We're a co-sponsor, yeah. Co-sponsor, okay. And we are having um, a couple of wonderful speakers there. Attorney General, Attorney, um, yeah, the General, Attorney General Nestle will be there. And also um, Alyssa Slotkin is going to be there. Let me get that up for you. Sorry. Um, oh, here it is. Are you seeing that slide? 
Yes. Okay. So it is a virtual seminar uh, from 10 to 3.30 over two days, 29th and the 30th. Um, I did put the link in the box for you to register. You can click on that. Um, it sounds like it's going to be a very extensive couple of days. I've registered for it. I think Christina has. It's going to be fascinating to see what all comes out of this. So I encourage you to take a look at that. And if you'd like to join our statewide firearm safety network, please contact me at that um, web address, email. Um, we have... Uh, gained quite a few people uh, and we're always welcoming for more. So are there any other questions we'd like to end with? Here's one. Um, would requiring that all gun owners carry insurance to cover costs associated with misuse of their guns help with decreasing numbers of guns? Um, it could. You know, one of the, so this is one of the things that the CAP laws, the child access prevention laws, sorry, I couldn't remember earlier, um, was trying to get at. Essentially, it's not really an insurance as much as if you're found to be in violation of that law, that you're held um, financially responsible in some way. And so it doesn't have to, it doesn't mean that the, that the uh, child ended up hurting themselves or someone else. It's just that they had access to a gun in a way that they weren't supposed to. And so um, then they're penalized, they're penalized um, financially for that. So it's, a, it's what the cap laws are starting to get to. And again, what we have seen in other states is that those who have a financial uh, component to it um, have been more effective than those without. Um, there can also be some jail time as well, but the, the monetary component of it so far has been the one that's been the most um, initiated throughout the states. Thank you. And Vicki, would you mention when the network meets and that there's a web page on the state um, website? Sure. We meet on the second Tuesday of the month at 7 p.m. And those are virtual meetings. And we have people from around the state um, that join us. Um, we've had quite a number of presentations thus far, so we're always looking to bring more people in. Um, what's, our goal here is education uh, and supporting legislation. So I guess we'd like to now thank all of you for coming this evening. Um, and I, I like to point out, you know, that Laura listed the methods that produce successes with other public health crises. And for me, it gives me a glimmer of hope that there is a way to, to eventually yield some results in the reduction of firearm violence. You know, it's a, it's a process, as she described it, gathering information, uh, studying this and seeing what's actually going to work. So, and I thank you, Laura, for your work in that area and for joining us tonight uh, and for Sue and Christina as well. And I hope everyone here has a lovely evening. Thank you all.